there we go. All right. So at the end of last class, we actually hadn't quite finished everything we had on the lecture two notes. So I'm just going to do a quick review back there to what we are covering. And the second last thing we looked at, or actually the last thing we looked at was this idea of the element of, so, hey, is some, is the number one a real number? Is the number one in or is the number negative three plus two i a real number? No, it's not. So that gave us something helpful for looking at, so I think my size is off here a bit, there we go. Um, that gave us something useful for individual elements. But of course, if I had a bunch of different numbers, I could ask, are they all in the reals or not? That kind of question. And the notation we use for that is subset notation. And it's done by the sort of curly or smooth out sideways U. Uh, so this is the subset operator indicator. And basically this is easier to see with a Venn diagram. So if you have a set A and you imagine it's represented by some circle here, if you've never seen a Venn diagram, let me know. I imagine this is <laughs> even through popular culture been something we've all seen. Uh, so if we have A and another set B inside of it, then we would say that B is a subset of A. Now, more formally, uh, we could take a look at these things here. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through these particular examples. They're not the kinds of things you see in your homework anyway. So I think we're gonna spend our time moving forward to the future notes, but this intuitive idea of something being a subset of another it is, I think most people don't struggle with this concept, so I don't wanna spend too much time on it. Um, if you had A here and then B had some intersection but was not completely inside of A, then what we would say is that, well, B here is not a subset of A, and furthermore, A is not a subset of B. So it's easy to have these turn into Cs and trying to make them explicitly look like a subset sideways U. Now, the border case is actually interesting. And that's where we have the same set. So if we have A and B is actually all the same values, all the same letters, all the same numbers, whatever we're defining our sets as, then we would have this interesting relationship that B is a subset of A, we would say that. And we would say that A is also a subset of B. Some of you may have seen a version of the subset thing where we add an extra bar here. We don't do that here. Uh, this in this subset can be is like less than or equal to is factored in here. If B is contained in A uh, or is equal to A, then that we'll still use the same symbol for all of those. And the reason that is, it makes some of the other things we want to do next a lot simpler. Specifically, uh, if we have two sets that are actually equal, so that example I just drew for you, then they are equal if and only if we can say that A is always contained in B and B is always contained in A. So that's another equivalency that we can say A is equal to B is the same as A is all contained in B and B is all contained in A. Again, I'm trying to make these look as <laughs> typeset as possible. All right, now I do wanna quickly review these uh, intersections or sorry these subset operations here just because it's a good reminder of the definition of what these z's here the z's are the integers and those are again including negative numbers oops minus two would usually be in that set in that order and one two and so on and so we would say that is a subset of the reals why? Because every element I can list here that's in the integers is a real number. So we can use that. Uh, we would not have a subset operation this way because what's n? n is what we're calling the natural numbers. And for the purposes of this course, the natural numbers includes the number zero and then all the positive integers. And it's very clear that a number like minus three is not in this set, so we cannot have Z being a subset of N. However, we do get these kinds of trivial subset things like, is the set of all integers the subset of all integers? Well, 
yes, sure, because they're the same thing. And we're going to this kind of relationship here where uh, if two sets are equal, then one is always a subset of the other. The other ones are pretty much what you'd expect. Uh, though maybe not entirely, actually. So the reals and the complexes, for these, we'd actually probably say no to all of them, unless we added some extra caveats, some extra space things. Uh, in particular, let's look, this, this one's probably the toughest one, and we can get into debates about that. These other ones are more clear. You might be thinking of R2 as the plane, and then you think of the real line as one set of real numbers. That's true, except the way we represent these things is that the R squared values, points on a plane, are defined by a tuple. So it's a combination of two values, two real values, whereas this is just a single value, C. And so these are sort of incompatible forms. There is a relationship between them, incompatible. But we can't say that the number C is somehow in the set of pairs of number, pairs of real numbers. That just doesn't make any sense. They're not the same uh, data type, if you like, if you're a computer programming person. Um, the same thing for the complexes and the reals. Like we draw this as a plane, we draw this as a plane. There's some parallels, but they're not subsets of one another. So we have to, this points to the possibility of other kinds of relationships besides subsetting that could be useful. Um, and sorry, going back to here, absolutely. If you went to this order, you would have that the natural numbers are a subset of the integers. That would be absolutely true because 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 is contained in the set of uh, integers as well. And there's some leftovers, but that's fine. This is a smaller set and every element in the smaller set is in the larger set. So that would be perfect. All right, I think we're gonna stop there for the week two notes, or sorry, lecture two notes. Yeah, these things tend to be kind of tedious in terms of the proof that one thing is a subset of the other. Uh, and it's not a central focus of the course. This is just getting us some concepts that we can use. So let me just save that. Always good policy, control S, and then we'll move on to today's notes. All righty. So, I'm sorry, for anyone who hasn't uh, already logged on to Clicker, we'll have a couple of questions scattered throughout the lecture today. And the access code, again, if you need it, is that QM3CXQ rolls right off the tongue. All right. So we've seen these two operations now very recently. And there's obviously other ways we can combine sets. So this is comparing sets. But we might have sets that we want to put together, take apart, that kind of thing. And most of you will, again, stop me. If, my impression is that most of you will have seen these operations, whether you formalize them or not. Um, but you've seen them before. The idea of a set intersection. So let's start off with two sets. We're going to call them S and T for the purposes of this page. And what I think of this as, as it's like an N shape. And so it's easy to remember that N shapes are intersections. So an N sound. So that's the reminder that this is the intersection symbol. And Venn diagrams are going to come back to our assistance here as well. If we had the two sets, S and T, and the idea is that we have individual elements in here, then this there's, we're going to get a new set. The new set S intersects with T is equal to this region here, which is equal to all elements, let's, let's call them X, that are in A, S, and that are in, or elements of T. And so we could actually formalize that a bit better. Uh, it would be a set of X's such that X is in S and X is in T. And not a huge shocker for the next one. Uh, for the union, this has sort of a, a U shape. So that's your mnemonic for remembering that's the union symbol. Then for this, we have the same kind of Venn diagram. We might have two sets. And the union is going to be anything that is in either one of them. So it's this is like adding. Uh, this is not quite like subtraction. We'll talk about subtraction in a second. But this is like pooling the two sets together. 
and S union T would be a set of elements such that the element is either in S or it's in T. If I can take all the elements of S, they're going to be in the union, and I take all the elements of T, they're going to be in the union. And if there's any overlap, that's okay, because sets just ignore duplicate values. And so we would get this collection here. Let me draw the board line. This entire set here is what we would graphically need to notice S union T. Now, last but not least, uh, in the notes in the online textbook, we have the set difference. I was just speaking with the other instructors today, uh, and and looking forward, this one actually doesn't get used very much, so this one feels a little weird, then that's totally fine. But basically, you can think of this as a set S minus T. Like, again, it's not minus, but uh, we're going to take out all of the elements from T that are in S. And so if we did a Venn diagram for that, and give it some labels so we know which one's which. Sorry, I should have that here before as well, S and T. So we have all the elements in S, and we're going to keep this set difference. Uh, the things that are in S, so we're starting with this pool here, we're starting with this, and then we're going to subtract the things that are in T. We don't want anything in T. So we're going to keep anything in S that's not in T. That's these guys, these guys, these guys. Well, in fact, that's everything up to the overlap. So it's this shape here that would be our set S intersection T, sorry, S difference T. So notice it's sort of like the, the opposite of the intersection in one sort of way, but not quite, because it's not quite symmetric. But basically those three things, intersection and union being the two most important and set difference being something you might use honestly more in, uh, in computation. I uh, just saw Madison's comment. If anyone else is having some difficulty with video lag, please do let me know. Um, it looks fine on my end, but I'm right beside my, myself. So, <laughs> all right. All right, so let's just do a quick example of these. And so we've got the two sets, tier one, two, three, and these ones. In fact, maybe it couldn't hurt this first time just to draw them out to represent them using a Venn diagram. And sorry, this is B this time. And a, and so each one of these values, we can say, well, is it an A and B or just one or the other? And zero is only an A. One is actually in both. Two is in A only, not in B. And three is in both. And minus one's over here, one, three, and five. Perfect. So if, for those who haven't used Venn diagrams as much here, I hope it makes it a little more easy to see. The set B has four elements in it. There it is. And so inside the circle of B, there's four numbers, but two of them are shared with the set of A because A also has four numbers. That's fine. There's four numbers in that set, but the overlap region uh, has one and three in it, just to indicate they're shared by both sets. In fact, that actually gets straight to the intersection, which is what's in that overlapping region. Well, one and three. If we take the union, again, that's the thing, the set of elements that are in either A or B. And so that gives us an exhaustive list. I'm just going to go through here, 0, 1, 2, 3, minus 1. We already have a 1. You could put it if you want. It doesn't really matter. But usually we wouldn't duplicate if we know it's a duplicate. Uh, 3 is also in there already, and 5 is in there already. Sorry, 5 is not in there, so we have to add it. And we can see that there's six elements here, and that corresponds perfectly to how many elements we get if we count up the number of values in this Venn diagram. There's six individual numbers, six unique numbers in that diagram, and that's what we see in the intersection, sorry, in the union there. And the intersection is just this region here, the set of values that are shared in both. And just for fun, uh, I've set up a clicker question for the last problem here. So you can try the difference. Remember the difference is I'm not going to draw it because that'll just give me the answer. Uh, but yeah, what would the difference be, A difference with B, in this case here? Perfect. All right. I won't belabor that, but I'll just flip over to the results so you can see them. Uh, 
yeah so we're, we're strongly there on d which is perfect because d is the zero two and again the a without b so taking out all elements that are in b leaves us with this little crescent in our venn diagram and that's just the points zero two zero and two all right so for now that's pretty much all we need in terms of set union intersection for sort of basic qualities if we want to get something a little more exotic then here's an example of that so here we've got again our natural numbers trying to get a mnemonic for all these the natural numbers which are the zero one two and up integers then here we have all values that are the cubes of integers so it makes sense to kind of just try to describe this first so what we can do is think about like a for loop in computation and all right so i'm seeing hit and miss mostly hits for quality there all right uh, there will be a recording afterwards and fingers crossed the recording should be decent quality so um if you are having trouble and feel like it's just so laggy you can't even bear to watch it i totally get that i've bailed on things before so uh if that's an issue just wait for the recordings we'll have them up hopefully later on tonight all right so x can be an integer so x can be anything from minus infinity up to these guys here those are the x's but we want the collection of c values which are those cubed so we're just going to take each of these numbers cubed and we would imagine seeing the pattern like minus three cubed is minus 27 minus two cubed is minus eight if i remember correctly and minus one cubed is minus one and so we'd get this pattern here again just sort of implying the continuity down at both ends with the three dots there and so we see these are not identical sets by any means this is lots of numbers but all zero and higher this is skipping numbers skipping a lot of numbers uh, but including some negative values as well pardon me so honestly i find the intersection easier to see and it's usually smaller so here if i take all the values that are in both of these we are only going to get the natural numbers at most so that rules out all of these negative things here we're not going to get them but zero it is in both one is in both eight will be in both 27 so we're basically going to get the positive cubed values that would be the intersection the values that are shared between both of these where i can see it in both sets the union is going to be a bit uglier hard to describe but we can imagine well let's start at the lower end with the negative values the only negative values we're going to get are the negative cubes so we're going to have a bunch of numbers and we're going to trust that the pattern implied here i'm not sure what decimal got in there negative eight negative one and zero and once we hit zero we are taking values that are in either set well the number one's in this set the number two's in this the number three so in the union we're going to find all the positive integers from there on in so we'd have the negative cubes the zero and then all positive integers after that when we take a union of those two sets and last but not least a without b that's an interesting option so we're going to take all of these values here and subtract or remove any values that might be positive integers or zero oh well i'm going to take out anything that's a positive integer that would be all these guys and that's just going to leave the negative oops, the negative cubes in our set for this set difference calculation here negative one and that would be we would stop there this time there's no dot 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 negative one would be the last number because zero is in both and we're going to remove anything that's in our natural number set all right so if that's the case then think about whether these things are where their order matters and what i mean by that is if you do a intersect b or b intersect a if you do a without b or b without a think about that do you get the same thing either way and for those who have gotten a little fancier uh this is about commutativity which is going to come up next week can i switch the order change the order 
uh, change the order without changing value. Changing value. All right, let me just flip over to the clicker thing here. It's looking good. We'll give it. We'll give it a quick fifteen seconds here. Yeah, so just uh, one question there. Why don't we cube the integers in the union? Because the union, right over here, uh, is anything that's in either one. So if I say, is zero in either one? Yes, it is. That's in both. One's in both. Is two in one or the other? Yeah, two's in there. So I do include two in the union. And then I look at three and go, yeah, three's, three's in the union because it's in the natural numbers. And pretty soon you realize, well, this is going to cover all my cases for the positive numbers. I'm going to have to look at the one up here. This is going to cover all positive integers. They're going to be in my union. All righty, let's flip over to the stats here. Okay, not too shabby. So the order matters. Oh, it looked much better on my screen. <laughs> the intersections were supposed to be in there. Ah, math notation is hard. What can I tell you? So yes, it matters for the set difference. So for the set difference, it does matter. For the set union and intersection, uh, either way is fine. So A intersect B is exactly the same as B intersect A. And likewise, A union B is the same as B union A. So it wouldn't have mattered which of these things we call the first set if we're doing unions and intersections. It does make a difference when we do the order. And you can kind of see that in the pictures back here, right? This set difference, we got one half of this. So it mattered whether you put S or T in there because we only got S elements left over. Uh, this part over here, if we did T difference with S, that would have been everything that's in T, but not in S. I just really should label these things. S and T, yeah. So there, it does make a difference which order you do them in. Alrighty. Uh, for sets, honestly, we don't do a whole lot of work with sets uh, that are infinite, especially because it gets really dicey to get into the minutia. How do you actually write these things out without just kind of waving your hands with dot, dot, dots? So for now, as long as you're understanding the concepts, that'll be fine. The best test for whether you know, you're kind of good, good handle on this is the tutorial problems and the web work, which typically deal with finite sets to avoid this kind of messy notation that's really not central. Um, we're going to see that usually we're dealing with infinite sets that have lots of nice properties. Uh, now we're just kind of dealing with the potentially ugly gener general set conditions or general set constructions. All right. So I'm now going to introduce two symbols that can be horribly abused if you're not careful. And, but they, they look very impressive and they seem fancy. So they're also just a nice short form that we use so often, especially in linear algebra. So here they are. The upside down A is read as for all or for any. And the idea is that we can maybe rewrite some of these intuitive statements like uh, the intersection statement or the subset statement and using these kinds of terms. Sorry, I'm just trying to bring up my own notes here for a second. There we are. So the way the subset uh, notation works is if A is a subset and B, then any element in A, any element X in A, let's put that a little more clearly, my apologies, is also in B, right? So one of the things that we can say that is for any element X that is in A, we get the implication or the results, or it implies that, it implies that, that X is in B, and sort of some implied here also. So there'd be a statement here. If A is a subset of B, then for any X at all, no matter what X I pick that's in A, I'm guaranteed that that X is also in B. 
so that's kind of how we use that uh, that for all thing. That's one of the examples. But think of it as for all or for any uh, in terms of the how you say it out loud. Then there's this backwards e that has this for there there exists. So think about the statement here for a second. A minus b is not zero. So let's just draw this little set here. So if I draw a and I draw b, and let me imagine what would I get if I had it equaling zero. So if I have a, and then maybe b is like this, a and b. In this case here, if I take a, but then I subtract everything that's also in b, I would get the empty set, right? Whereas up here, a, if I subtract B, I don't get the empty set. That's sort of the two scenarios. Here, there's something in A that's not in B as well. Here, everything in A, unfortunately, it's also subsumed by B as well. Unfortunately, but it just happens to be the way it is. Well, that means there's something in this part here, this little crescent-shaped thing that we uh, saw before. There is an element in there. Oh, that means... If A slash B is not equal to the empty set, then there exists an X value that's in A, but not, but X is not an element of B, not an element of B. In fact, there it is. <laughs> I know there's at least one thing hiding in that part of this diagram that satisfies that X is in A, but it's not in B. And this, that's where this there exists thing uh, symbol comes in handy. I don't know what that number is. I just know that there has to be one because we said the A slash B was not empty. So there had to be some element. There had to exist some element in A that was not being deleted when we subtracted B. So, alrighty. So yeah, key message to this for all and there exists. They just come in handy when we're describing sets. We have time. Oh, geez. All right. I'm going to have to pick up the pace a little bit. I apologize. Um, all right. This is the key stuff for this class, uh, for this lecture, is mappings and functions. So we are going to uh, tweak just a little bit the definition that we're using for functions compared to what you've seen in calculus and previous math courses. And one of it, one part of it stuff you have seen. So we're going to map now from one set to another set. So now we have two sets at play right now. Up till now, we just had one set and it's kind of hanging out by itself or maybe intersection, that kind of thing. But now we're going to take values in one set and we're going to map them to a value in the other set. So here in our S and T. And our function is what's doing this. Now, the output value here, this is like calculus like calculus, like calculus. Uh, if you have an input value, you only have one output value. You, you don't have one input going to two output values. So it's like you can't have x going to y1 and y2. That is verboten. That's a big x. Functions don't do that. They never have. What's new here, and perhaps a bit annoying, is the each element here. This is new. This means that every element uh, in the input set has a defined output. Has a defined output. And we're going to go through some examples showing why does this cause grief, especially in calculus type functions. Um, so in this case here, we've got some nice names. S is called, not surprisingly, the input set or sometimes using more calculus type terminology, uh, the domain set. T, of course, would be the output set or the target set. We try to avoid the word range, which might be something you go for because uh, it's not the range exactly, as we'll see through some examples. All right. Um, yeah, let me just pause there. This format here is a little more explicit than what we've done with describing functions before. So usually what we just said f of x equals like x cubed, something like that. Um, but when we take a look at 
this new version where we're explicitly defining the sets, I think you'll see there's there's some subtle shading that comes in with that, but it helps to actually make things a little clearer or at least more transparent about what's happening. So let's take things that we know. Y equals sine of X. We would write that now as F is a function that maps from the reals to the reals and every X gets mapped to sine of X. All right, so in some sense, not a big deal. It's just explicitly saying what the input and the output values are. And you can think back to 171 where we had, you know, functions of time that mapped to, or even 172 now, uh, when you're going around the ellipse, you had values of time and parameterized curves where you got X's and Y's back. This is a nice way to encapsulate that and say, no, 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 okay, we got real inputs and maybe two dimensional outputs. We might've had R2 there. Let's stick with 1D for today though. Uh, one variable functions here we would have the same kind of thing. I'm going to map real numbers to real numbers. The function is e to the three x, so that's fine. And every x is going to get one e to the three x value back, so that's fine. So these are both great. Where we get into some wrinkles is this example here. So if we claim this is the case, x goes to one over x. If you think about domains and these kinds of uh, questions and the fact that domain came up so explicitly, this is actually a problem because we need every input, input X to have a defined output, have a defined output. And where's the problem with this? But the zero in this function maps to one over zero, which is not an element of the reals. So basically this is not a function. <laughs> this is not a function. Uh, but here's where it comes handy. Uh, it's not a function on the reals to the reals. So just for a second here, you might go, but, but <laughs> we've been calling it a function all year or for the last two years, whatever many, when when the last time you saw one over X's, it is a function. Well, yeah. What does calculus do to get around this? And this is what I hinted at in our first lecture about calculus being a pile of rules that kind of fit together and kind of make it work. Whereas linear algebra is like, no, 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 this, these pieces must fit perfectly. There's none of this edge case silliness going on. What we do in calculus, we actually wave our hands a lot. And we would say that y equals one over x is actually a function that maps some set s to the reals and x goes to one over x, where s is equal to the set of all values where x is real, but x is not equal to zero, right? We talk about the domain of one over x and say, well, yeah, yeah, we know that you can't plug zero into there, so we just kind of leave it out. And so this definition lets us do that, but it doesn't let us kind of brush the issue of the bad inputs under the carpet it says, no, no, if you're going to do this, you better say where this function is defined and not cheat about it. So you actually have to define a valid input set. So just be aware of that. So a lot of the functions that we know and love are exactly what you'd expect in this new notation. Anytime there's an asymptote or an undefined point or undefined interval, their linear algebra is going to ask us to get fussier and say, yeah, well, on what set are you actually allowed to send uh, what set are you actually going to use as the input set? What, what are you excluding from that here, like the value zero for the function one over X? And so of course that leads to a whole pile of other things that would not be functions. Uh, I had a clicker question, but I think we'll skip that in the interest of time. But you can imagine anything that has an asymptote. So like tan of X is not a function because of its asymptotes. Uh, Lawn of X isn't defined for negative numbers. Eh, this might be a good chunk of it. What else? Oh, square roots. Square roots with real numbers. Square root of X isn't defined past for negative numbers, so things like that. Can we get a little more exotic, like mix and match what we do with our functions here and our other new kinds of sets, like our natural numbers and our uh, integers? Absolutely. So, sorry, what was I going to do here? Right. If we map the natural numbers to the natural numbers with a squared function, we might ask what is the range, this time I will use a range, 
equals the part of the target set that is reached. Reached, and by reached, I mean part of the output. Uh, so many different ways to say this. Or mapped to by at least one input. And you'll see what I mean here when we actually do this. There's a lot of words to say. What values do you get back out? So the range set for this is going to be, imagine taking all natural numbers. So the input 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And if we square it, the output is going to be 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, and so on. And that looks perfectly valid. We took natural numbers in. We get some. The rule about having to cover everything is not required for the output, it's just for the input. But every input has a single output. Every single integer I put into this squaring function gives me a new, uh, sorry, every natural number I put in gives me a natural number back. And we can do similar things with the integers like this, uh, up to minus two, minus one, zero, one, two. When we run those through the function, we get the same numbers Oh, actually, we have the same numbers back, except plus one. So we'd have like a bunch of numbers minus one, zero, one, two, oops, one, two, three, and so on. So these are the ranges. This is the set of values that we get out of this function given the input sets we have. And another interesting one, we could take the naturals as the input. So that's again starting at zero. And then finding the output if we add one to all of those, which are in fact integers as well as natural numbers. And there we get one, two, get my commas interspliced there, four and so on. There we are. So we can define functions on other sets and that's dandy, that's fine. Usually it's not that interesting. I'll be honest, most of the time we do work with the reals, but what's more interesting to me right now is actually this part here actually got the same set back. So there's transformations of individual values, but there's also what range of values do I get over, if I take all the possible inputs, what kind of outputs do I get? Kind of like a graph. And this case here, I actually reproduced the entire set. Well, that's interesting. That's different from these ones here where I got some natural numbers, but not all of them. And it turns out this idea of having unique or not unique things uh, is a useful way to categorize functions. So we're talking about functions again. Functions take one set into another set. And the versions we're looking at here, or the characterizations we're interested in, are called injective, surjective, and bijective. And there are other ways to phrase this. In fact, these are the phrases that are used in your web work ass assignment. So I want to make sure we cover those. Injective is also called one-to-one. -one. Let me try to make that more legibly. One-to-one. -one. And where's the math on this? All right. So if you have an input X and another input Y, so two input values, as long as they're different, then we should get two different outputs. So if we pick X and Y, we have to get two different values for the output. It would be bad or not injective, not one-to-one, -one, if we had x and y, so two different inputs that end up in the same output. That would be not injective. That's f of x equals f of y. And this is like squareds, right? If you had minus two and plus two and you square them, you get four for both of those. That would be something that's not injective. Uh, surjective is also known as onto, and you can think of this like a, it's, I don't know, I mean, it's just the French, uh, surjective, it's, uh, it's on top of, um, so it fully covers the output. And here we're going to get to practice our, their existence for all. So if I take any element in the output set, so imagine you got your sets now, if I take any element here, you can think of this as the integers, if you like, sort of like all in a row. You pick any one of them you like. There exists, guaranteed, if this function is surjective, there exists some x in the original set over here. 
So you pick one random one here, you're guaranteed there's gonna be an X on the other side that is the input for that output. And that's true for no matter what value you pick on the other side. So going back a slide here, this function here, we would call surjective because the entire collection of output values we can get is all of the integers. I can always find a way, you know, if I pick any random integer like 10, I can always find an input that would get me there. Here would be nine. Yeah, so we're looking at every, sorry, let me double check here. Yeah, it's very similar to the vertical horizontal line tests. Uh, I'd have to think about that for a second or two to think <laughs> to make sure I'm not screwing up on you. But yes, it's got that kind of vibe. Uh, sorry, being a function, sorry, let me just draw this quickly for a second. Being a function at all uh, is the vertical line test. So we've already passed that. Bijective is actually the horizontal line test is both of those guys together. Uh, do, 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 do. We never really talk so much in calculus about surjective. We never really cover, care about covering all the reals. That's not really a thing. Bijective is the combo of injective plus surjective. And this is invertible in a more stringent sense than what you're thinking about with the, uh, the horizontal line test. And because this guarantees, guarantees, for sake, guarantees uh, invertibility. As you can imagine, because when you do this, every element on the output has a previous input and it guarantees that there's no duplication. I never get this thing where I have an output that goes back to two of them. That would be possible if I just had surjective. Honestly, I find the diagram on the next page is the most helpful for this. So this is the both block here. And you can see when you go to one of the not categories, either one row or one column off, this not injective has two inputs that's lead to the same output. That's not injective. When we talk about not surjective, that's where we have some lonely elements left over. Let me hear that. Uh, lonely, uncovered, covered output values. So again, if I look for surject, so everything in this thing here, if you look down the column of outputs, I, can I get to one? Yes. Can I get to two? Yes. Can I get to three? Yes. Four or five? Yes. Over here, same thing. Can I get to one? Yes. But in more than one way. So that's true. It's, it's, I'm covering all the outputs. Every output has an input, but it's not injective because, well, I get to this one output from two different inputs. Then you can have the opposite kind of scenario here. Uh, everything was covered here. Everything's not covered here. The four doesn't have an antecedent in the function. The one doesn't, but for every value I do have, I can go backwards. If there is a value here, I get to, there's only one inverse for it. So it's sur sorry, it's injective, but it's not surjective because not every output has a, is found with this uh, transformation. There's some values where the, the inputs don't map to a certain output value. Hoo-wee, all right. <laughs> so again, let's put this in context for real-to-real -real functions. So maybe we can talk about the horizontal and vertical line test and things like that. So injective, injective, which again, it's sometimes helpful to think about those other expressions. Injective was one-to-one. Uh, -one. So, and again, I find that a little deceptive because that sounds like it's also invertible. It's not um, one output equals one single input. That's really, I think, better, better capturing what we want here. So if you think of a function that does that, but is not surjective, there's actually a whole pile of functions that do this. So surjective means the output is not all of the real numbers. And so, sorry, I have examples in mind here. And I'm just going blank. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, e to the x, of course. So y equals e to the x. That graph looks like this. 
I know that every Y value I pick, every Y value I pick, I can go back to a single X value. And so it is injective, but it's not surjective because I'm missing uh, the zero and negative real outputs. Uh, another function in that same vein would be something like arctan, just to give you another context. Arctan of x, arctan of x would have that same structure where uh, I can certainly invert it in the sense that if you give me a y value, any of the y values that are in there, I can go back to a single x value, but I'm missing part of the output domain. Now, Bijective is almost easier than the one in between. So I'm gonna do that first. So someone mentioned y equals x cubed. Absolutely, that's a classic example of a bijective function. The output covers all the reals. In other words, this y value range here is infinitely large. I can get any y value out I want uh, from some input. And every y value I have is a single x value that gave rise to it. And so, of course, everything in that family too, like x to the 5 or x to the 7, those are all perfectly bijective. One that's in the middle is actually kind of close to this. We can break the injective part by just having a loop back on itself. So I think this is x, yeah, let's just do the roots, x minus 1, x plus 1. This one here we cover all the output range. Eventually this, this is a cubic and it's gonna go off to infinity and down to negative infinity. So we cover all the output, that's surjective. Output cover all of R, R, all of R. But it's not injective, why? Because well, if I have these two, let's take this Y value here, this Y value here and this Y value here, I can get the same y value, not every y value, but it gets the same y for those cases there with two different x's. And so that is obviously the thing that surjective is all about. I'm sorry, inject is all about. It gets same y with two different x's. Yeah, and you can actually feel this, right? This fails the horizontal line test, so it's not invertible. So not injective means not invertible. Uh, whereas this one here is glorious, it's bijective, it is invertible, has all those nice properties. So you're going to have to have these kinds of definitions or properties of functions pretty well understood and being able to translate the new terminology, if you haven't seen it before, injective and surjective into something that means something to you. If you find the one-to-one -one and onto helpful, then by all means use that. As I mentioned in web work, we're actually going to use these phrases. I think it's in the sixth question uh, in the web work. So be prepared for those kinds of questions and to using that kind of terminology. Um, right. This question here, I'm just trying to point at the importance of the, the domain set or the target set. If we take a look at e to the x, like e to the x is a great function. It's definitely injective. It's one-to-one -one in the sense that every y value just comes from one x. The only reason it's not surjective is because we are missing the negatives and the zero value. Those are not possible outputs for the exponential function. But we could fix that by just choosing a different function. So we could say, let g be a function that maps x to e to the x. And we're going to map the reals in. That's fine. And we're going to map to some set called t where t is all the values x that are reals, but that the x's are greater than zero. And what does that do? Well, it basically says, oh, well, I'm only interested in output values that are, I shouldn't include the axis here, but zero and above zero here, in which case the exponential function, y equals e to the x, does in fact cover every single value in t output of e to the x is all of t. So g is uh, surjective here. So we can sometimes tweak our sets so that we get a property that we want. And this very much is like the arc sine 
shenanigans where we had we were trying to invert a function that went up and down a bunch of times we said well let's not do that let's pretend we're only looking at some part of the interval and we limited our domain so this is a fix you've seen before um yeah Sorry. checking on the time again oh goodness we are out of time all right composition we're not going to ask you to do a lot of this right now so i'm just going to basically lay out the idea You've seen this before, I think, again, in different contexts, but the idea that we take a function of a function and the notation we're gonna use is this circle notation where G follows F. And let's take a set A here. The idea is we have elements there that get mapped to a set B, right, through F. F is our function that does that. Oh, and then by the way, yeah, we're gonna have another function G that takes those elements and maps them to a third set, C. So A, B, C, give these different colors to highlight that they're different kinds of operations. So I've got a function that takes real numbers and squares them or something. And then I might apply some other number that turns it into a vector quantity or something. So we can compose these functions. We call it G circle F or uh, G follows F or G is composed with F. That's all common terminology, I think. Yeah, I don't want to get into that given that it's Friday afternoon, we're running low on time. And I don't think there's a web work related to this. So we will start next week, right fresh and new with systems of linear equations. All right, thank you very much. I'll also happily stick around if anybody has any questions. Otherwise, I'll wish you all a very good weekend.